I'm Mo Alethi, Executive Director of the Institute of Politics and Public Service at Georgetown University's McCord School of Public Policy. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be talking with you, Kristen. Um, you are one of the nation's leading experts on young voters. And you've done a lot of these focus groups and you've tracked how young people uh, uh, interface with the democratic process and their political activity. You know, here we are right on the heels of a historic election uh, and getting a chance to talk to first time participants. So uh, maybe just like what your key takeaways were from, from the last hour long conversation. Sure, it was a really fascinating discussion. We had seven participants from across the country, um, from different types of areas, suburban, rural, urban, um, from all sorts of walks of life. Uh, and each of them had a different story for why this was the first time they cast a ballot. For some of them, they had registered when they were in high school and they have since turned 18 and this was their first chance to do it. But for others, they said, look, I took a pass on past elections. Either the candidates hadn't inspired them or logistically it would have been challenging for them to vote because they were at school, but they were registered to vote at home. Where this time, in some ways, because of the pandemic and the expansion of mail-in voting for some of them, um, participating was a little bit easier this time. Um, I was really struck by how many of them, on the one hand, were willing to say, look, I'm not sure that my one individual vote is swinging an election, but that's right. also not the point. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it because I think that these things I'm voting on, I'm gonna be the deciding vote, but rather if people like me don't vote, then in those aggregate numbers, those numbers are smaller. And for young people, those numbers are smaller. And so by just putting my vote into the bucket, by casting my ballot, even if it's not the make or break vote, it's at least sending a message that I care. And that stuck out to me as a pretty big finding. Yeah, no, I, uh, similarly, I, I thought it was really interesting that every single one of them felt like they had an obligation to participate in the process. They wanted to, first of all, right? Like they were excited to have participated in the process, but they felt like they had an obligation. They thought it was important and it was one of the clearest ways to have their voices heard. But at the same time, there was still, at least I picked up on a, a healthy skepticism of the process, right? We kept hearing phrases like voter suppression and yeah. corruption in politics. And several of them commented on the what they perceived as the unfairness of the electoral college system and how they felt like that had the potential to negate their voice. And yet they all felt it was important to participate and would encourage their peers to participate. And I, I, I was really struck by that. Yeah, you know, we, we posed the question, what would you change about the system if you could kind of go back and start from scratch with everything we've learned? And the Electoral College did seem to be the biggest thing that folks said they might consider doing differently. Uh, and it could be in part because this conversation is taking place in the immediate aftermath of the 2020 election. This is very top of mind for a lot of folks. But there was just a lot of discussion about how for some of them, it didn't quite seem to make sense that they felt like maybe their politics were out of step with the state where they lived in such dramatic fashion that they said, well, I'm going to cast my vote, but it's not actually going to change how my state behaves in the Electoral College, which then I think also raised the interesting question of the things further down the ballot. So for these young voters, they felt pretty well informed about what they wanted to do at the presidential level. And that was driving a lot of their decision making. But for many of them, they would look at that ballot and all of a sudden there's stuff further down that ballot about judges or ballot initiatives. And suddenly they were saying, you know, I wish I had resources that would make it a lot easier for me to think through what are the issues that matter to me, which for many of them, it was issues like climate change, healthcare. Okay, and then how are those issues affected by my decisions all the way down this ballot? I may know at the presidential level who I align with on climate change or healthcare, but what are the implications for that local judicial race? How does that affect things like climate change or healthcare? That seemed to be the resource that most of them um, would have found to be really helpful when they were going through the process. Yeah, and to, and to pick up on that, I mean, they all felt an obligation to find out as much as they could, right? But there was also a healthy dose of skepticism about the information that was available to them. And we kept hearing about media bias from a number of them. 
and, and a frustration, I think, with the information ecosystem. And one of them spoke at length about the echo chambers that we find themselves that we find ourselves in, and and how that um, uh, information ecosystem feeds into that. And and it was almost as if the, the frustration was 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 palpable over that. Yeah, and a lot of them you can tell, you know, would talk about having heard about this election from social media. So, you know, when we said, were you contacted by a campaign or anybody talking about voting? Um, there was a mix of some folks said they had gotten more conventional, you know, I got a campaign mailer or I got a phone call or I got a text message. But for many of them, it was more that there was just this kind of atmosphere on social media and all around them about voting mattering and what issues mattered most. Um, so it, it was it was not as though they each had, you know, an identical pattern of how they were contacted by a campaign or how they were, you know, sort of nudged to participate. Um, for some of them, it was totally self-driven. And for others, it was that they had seen this kind of conversation happening on social media and wanted to be do their part. So, you know, to wrap up, you know, a political data nerds like you and I, I know we're still trying to crunch all the numbers uh, uh, here in the immediate days following the election, but you know, you've been tracking young people's participation in the political process for some time. I'm wondering if more broadly, beyond the group we just spoke to, if you have any observations on youth participation in the 2020 election. Well, we know that young voters in this upcoming, or in this, we know that young voters in this past election were more energized than they have been in the, over the last at least decade um, of participating. We will know once all of the votes are cast and once we can go back and analyze uh, the, the voter lists in each state and who did and didn't participate, we'll get more concrete data. Um, but at the moment, it does seem as though um, young people participated in really big numbers. We are on track for an overall national vote turnout that's going to well exceed what we saw in 2016. Young voters being new to the process are going to be a big driver of that. What I also think is really interesting is that if you look at some of these, you know, exit poll voter analysis type studies, um, you'll notice that voters who are nowadays in kind of their 30s and early 40s are voting in the same kind of partisan patterns that they were when they were younger. And it really just, I think, emphasizes to, to me that for the political parties, reaching young voters is so important because as you age, you don't necessarily change your views wholesale as you move from phase of life to phase of life, that the things you care about when you're young and the way you view the world when you're young does tend to have a, a lot of ripple effects and echoes. And so I think, you know, hearing from these young voters today, issues like climate change, issues like healthcare, these are things our political leaders are going to have to address if they want to be able to connect with the, uh, this new generation of voters. Yeah, I think that's right. So big takeaway, democracy is good. Democracy works even as it's flawed. And I'll be interested to see how these young people continue their, their engagement with democracy uh, moving forward. Kristen, thanks so much for leading this conversation, for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me, Mo.